My name is Linda Locke. I am president of the Berryessa Citizens Advisory Council. Normally, this would be our general membership meeting, but instead we are having a special event, a Zoom meeting for the candidates forum for Santa Clara County Supervisor. Kenson Chu and Otto Lee are with us tonight. Okay. Uh, we will not have uh, our usual updates from our elected officials or from the sheriff or police as we want to put as much time in with the candidates as we can. Um, the minutes for our regular, our last meeting, which was March, will be uh, sent out electronically later on. Um, Susan, I'm going to read your, um, your treasurer's report. I have here someplace. And beginning balance of June 1st, 2020 was $3,598.97. Uh, we had supply reimbursements. Uh, August 29th, we had a candidate forum donations that were uh, sent in to us from the co-sponsors. And so we now have 3000 $692.47. Our Beautify San Jose Grant Cycle 2 still has $68.50 in it, which the city said they don't want, so we have to figure out a good way to spend it, and we will before the time's up. Cycle 3 Grant, but that is the mural, and I'll let um, Ty speak to that in a minute, but we still have the $5,000 that was granted to us. They've extended the timeline, so we have a whole year to get that going and, and get completed. So I'll let Ty talk about where that status is on the mural for the front of the community center. Ty? Thank you, Linda. Um, back in February, we held a kickoff meeting. We coordinated among the Office of Cultural Affairs, uh, Lynn Rogers, uh, myself as team lead for the BCAC, we had the artist, John Pugh, and we talked about this thing off and how we would fund it. The uh, Office of Cultural Affairs uh, felt it was their obligation as part of their charter to maintain public art, that they would fund the artist's restoration of the project. Uh, and that came to approximately 20 grand with the agreement that we would use our cycle three money to pay for the productive coating that would be applied to the exterior of, of the mural to protect it from sun and from weather. Um, so that's what we kicked off. Um, project actually started. We hosted a, a team of um, citizens around the art process and public art that John hosted on our behalf and actually started work on the wall itself, doing surface work and visual preparation. And so, um, sorry, hang on just a second. You can stand until she turns around. I don't. I'll talk to you later. He has his movement. He turns around and leaves it. All right. Um, sorry for the interruption. Then COVID struck. Uh, restrictions shut down the community center that uh, prevented any work from proceeding. Uh, since that time, uh, of course, there have been attempts to begin to unwind those restrictions. And so uh, that is in the process of being discussed among the parties, the community center, the Office of Cultural Affairs, and the artists. Uh, the big important thing at this juncture is to note that the Office of Cultural Affairs was able to secure and hold on to the 20 grand in spite of efforts by the city to claw back money due to the unexpected COVID expenses. So the project is still viable financially. Um, John Pugh, the artist, is currently in Missouri doing installation there and we'll take him through mid-October. So we have a target uh, of mid to late October to restart the project. It will take approximately two weeks uh, to finish it. Um, and the issues to be resolved are access to water and power after normal center hours. We're working that. The BCAC has a quote from a credible uh, 
individual to apply the protective coating and as well within our budget. So we think we're in a good position to complete this project, hopefully by the end of the year. <laughs> uh, you know, hold your breath. Uh, or no, don't hold your breath. Don't hold uh, your breath. <laughs> stay tuned. We will keep you informed as things progress. But right now, things look like they're falling into place and that um, it will work out okay for us. Uh, and I'm open to questions. Uh, Linda? Yeah, no, I just think we just needed to be updated so that they know this is not a, a dead project. It's just in limbo at the moment, but it will be resuming probably mid-October. The, 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 the wheat is being ground just very slowly. <laughs> Sure, but at least, I mean, Ty's really done a lot of work keeping conversation going and keeping in touch with the Office of Cultural Affairs and with the, the artists. So, so things will, will move eventually, I'm sure. Of course, once he starts, it's gonna start raining, which we haven't seen any rain at all. So it probably will start raining then. <laughs> okay. If you're I done. Go off video then, and I'm gonna try to make sure that Richard Santos can join. Uh, there's a problem there, but um, I will be a listener. Okay. All right. I'm going to uh, list the co-sponsors besides BCAC. We have uh, the, the um, Berryessa Milpitas Republican Assembly, the Berryessa uh, North San Jose Democratic Club, the River Oak Neighborhood Association, and the Berryessa Business Association. So all of those have contributed to tonight's festivities that we have. All of the questions uh, were submitted by members of each one of these sponsored groups. And they were all submitted to the screening committee. We screen the questions based on um, different uh, departments like transportation, budget, that kind of thing. And then we narrowed them down to questions. Sometimes you'd have two or three questions that were very similar and we'd only needed to be having one in that, uh, in that area. So Will Ector, our former superintendent of Berryessa Schools, Schools is our moderator tonight. And he will be talking to the, um, the candidates, Otto Lee and Kenson Chu. There'll be no questions from any audience or anybody else. Uh, and none of us panel members here will be talking either. So we will all be muted and Will will take over and explain all of the rules and the procedures that we will be following. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, Linda. And first of all, I'd like to welcome all the residents, all the members of the various Citizens Advisory Council for which I was a member there for the almost seven plus years that I was in the, in the area and also all of the residents of District 3. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, our goal tonight is that this event will give you uh, uh, information so that you may cast a very informed ballot when you go to, uh, go to, to the ballot box on November 3rd, the election night. We're grateful that our candidates, uh, Mr. Otto Lee and Mr. Kansen Chu, have set aside time to be here with us tonight. Uh, tonight's format, we're going to have a Zoom format, as you very well are, are into now, but tonight has been structured where you're going to be able to, as an audience member, be able to see and hear both myself and the candidates only. Uh, you will not have the ability to speak or have any uh, access to the chat feature as you might be used to. Now, we're here to determine who our representative is going to be for District 3. District 3 is one of five districts for, this, for the county. And our population District 3 is just under 340,000 residents. District 3 is comprised of parts of Sunnyvale, Milpitas, the Eastern Foothills, uh, most of Berryessa, parts of Allen Rock, and most of the Evergreen communities, and a large unincorporated area that extends over the East Foothills going toward Mount Hamilton. They also oversee an annual budget of over $8 billion a year, and they manage some of the largest uh, uh, departments. Departments such as the Sheriff's and District Attorney's Office, the County and uh, County Health and the Hospitals, the Department of Corrections, which includes all the jails, all social services, behavioral health science, I mean health services, the fire districts, as well as the county parks, just to name a few. Now, November 3rd election uh, will be a uh, uh, runoff between our candidates. And both candidates, uh, like I said, once again, we, we're glad that they're going to be here with us. But I've reviewed tonight's guidelines with the candidates already. Uh, and I'll go over them just a few briefly. First of all, each candidate is going to be given uh, 
two minutes to introduce themselves um, before we get started with the questions. Each candidate is going to be given a question and they'll have two minutes to respond. I'll be holding up an uh, inverted 30 second sign. I say inverted because I wrote it on this side as 30 seconds, but you'll see it inverted when I show it to you. Uh, and then we'll also have uh, the stop, at, at which time we hit the 30, uh, we're done. Uh, our technician will be able to control the microphones. Now, candidates may ask questions, may ask to have a question repeated, uh, but when, which time will not be counted against their two minutes uh, allocated time to answer that particular question. Uh, we ask that the candidates do not interact between each other as we go through tonight's procedure. Now, at the end of all of our questions, and we have uh, quite a few to go through, each candidate will be given two minutes to make closing statements. So that being said, we're going to get the program started. And I'm going to have uh, Mr. Kansen Chu begin, first of all, by introducing himself. Mr. Chu? Chu. Can you hear me? Well, uh, yes. yes. All right, great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having us tonight. I know how uh, difficult it is for, for all of you to get this Zoom going. You know, we have some technical problems just last week when we were test run uh, this uh, uh, Zoom meeting. You know, it's really been a great, great honor for me to serve the community of Berryessa, North San Jose, Alviso for the last 20 years. I really, really couldn't have done that without your trust and your support. And of course, uh, many of my uh, very dedicated staff. You know, I, actually I wouldn't, I wouldn't have, to, uh, have run for the assembly if not were for the effort of BCAC putting during the redistricting in 2011. You know, we, the Barrios area was split into four assembly districts, and through your effort, uh, we'd be able to hold Barrios as a whole and, and give me the encouragement to even uh, 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 run for this assembly seat. So I want to definitely thank the BCAC for your civic engagement. You, uh, you keep our citizens informed and engage, and this is one of the longest running community uh, uh, organization. And Rona, you know, I have a great working relationship with Rona. Uh, when I was on the San Jose City Council, they helped me draft the North San Jose uh, neighbor, uh, neighborhood plan. I know that uh, right now they're thinking about breaking down the four phases that we have agreed upon uh, back in, in, in the days. Uh, so I definitely will oppose that. I think, you know, it started off as a, 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 a job plan. We need to keep it as a job plan. Well, the decision for me to run for the uh, county supervisor has nothing to do with which position is a higher position or which is a lower position or has anything to do with which uh, campaign is easier or harder. I'm running for county supervisor uh, simply because I want to bring my 20 years of public services experience home, bring it home to make strong impact to many issues uniquely important to Santa Clara County, such as homeless, uh, 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 transportation, and income equality. And thank you very much for having me here. You're muted. Okay. Uh, well, we can hear you. You muted. What's good having having a, a, a two minute warning when you can't hear the bell? <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Otto Lee, you now have the have the floor, please, for your introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for the BCC for your hard work uh, to put this uh, forum together to inform our <laughs> what's going on. And the county, of course, is a very important position. Uh, after uh, Dave Cortez has served well uh, for the past 12 years. Uh, my name is Otto Lee. For those of you who don't know me, let me give you a quick introduction. Uh, I'm a father of three uh, daughters. I'm an immigrant uh, from Hong Kong. Uh, I've been working as an intellectual property attorney for the past 25 years and also served in the U.S. Navy, active in reserve for, uh, as a supply officer for the past 28 years. And I just retired a year ago as a Navy commander. I've served eight years on the Sunnyvale City Council, uh, including the term as the Green Mayor, in one of America's 10 safest cities. 
I was uh, recalled to active duty and served in Iraq uh, at the time when Barack Obama first got elected as president in 2009 to help bring our troops home and award the Bronze Star. I've dedicated my life to serve the public to improve our community. Now I'm running for supervisor to solve these type of problems, the rising homelessness, the ridiculous housing costs, traffic jams, and safe neighborhoods, and to help reopen the economy after this pandemic. We need to provide affordable housing for our seniors, our teachers, and our students, our at-risk families and veterans who have protected us. I'll fight to increase mental health services so people on the streets can get the care they so desperately need and a place to stay. And I will lead efforts to reduce traffic and air pollution, improving public transportation, including the electrifying of Caltrain and BK buses. We need to work on emergency preparedness from either earthquake or just a wildfire preparation that we are seeing all over the place. We look outside, see air quality. Strengthening our VMC, Valley Medical Center, which is our gym, our healthcare systems, our nurses and our first responders. For me, this is not just another political job. It is personal to me because these are very serious challenges that will affect our kids' future. I'm honored to be sitting down the Unity Camp in this race, being supported by both SVO and Labor, because I believe if we work hard together, we really can fix them. In this case, we have no choice. We have to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. And now, at this time, we're going to enter our questions. We have 21 questions for our candidates tonight, and the questions uh, cover a, a large uh, area of, of topics. First and foremost, we have two dealing with county budget. We have another two dealing with the COVID-19 scenario, three dealing with crime and justice, two dealing with development, one dealing with homelessness, one with housing, two with the outreach and access, two dealing with policy and law, two also dealing with public safety, and two dealing with the supervisor's role and the campaign that's underway, and two dealing with transportation in our area. That being said, as I said, we're gonna get started. We've already drawn uh, lots at this point. We're gonna start with the county budget. The first question, this is gonna to go to uh, 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 Mr. Chu, and we'll alternate each question, uh, who goes next, who goes first. Uh, Kansen. How will you handle the county's budgetary concerns as a, as a result of COVID-19 while continuing to provide essential services to the community? Definitely, it is a, a, a big task ahead of us. You know, I can share with you that uh, I was on the South City, City Council uh, during the 2008 uh, recession. We're trying to definitely protect the core services of the this, of this city and at this time, we make sure that the, uh, the public safety, the public health departments are uh, pretty much well funded to be able to do their, their, their work. And def, uh, also looking for ways to expand our uh, a revenue source, you know, and I definitely will also make sure that a lot of uh, shovel ready projects can get it going, can so we have to uh, work, providing a job opportunity for 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 the people, and 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 also carefully open up the economy so people can get back to work and also contribute to the uh, the, the tax the sales tax and other 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 tax revenue for the uh, county. This is not an easy task. You know, but I assure you that I have uh, done that before. You know, I have the experience of uh, uh, leading San Jose through a speedy recovery after the 2008 recession. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lee, the county budget. Yes. Thank you, Will. Okay, um, I'll read it again for you. How will you handle the county's budgetary concerns as a result of COVID-19 while continuing to provide essential services to the community? Right. So the county's budget, as you mentioned, Will, is about $8.1 billion. Um, it is really a huge budget. And of that, about half of it actually is being spent on our healthcare system, the Valley Medical Center. Mm -hmm. uh, really a great healthcare system that we have. Uh, the problem we're looking at is that with COVID, we're guesstimating right now at least half 
a billion dollar, half a billion dollars of deficit just for this coming year. And this is extremely serious. Um, in terms of how to find more re revenues, obviously one of the first thing we could cut is, of course, getting rid of the unfilled uh, county positions. And that's exactly what the county has been doing already right now. But that's only a you know, number of games of, of moving things around. Ultimately, is you got to have the money to continue spending. And so there has been a reserve that is being drawn down. And this is actually a good idea because just like when I was in Sunnyvale, we actually have a 20-year budget, 20-year budget, which is very unique among different cities, where we've been accruing. So every year when there's a surplus, instead of spending it on things one time, you try to save it up to build up this reserve so that in downtime, like in when con conditions like what we are now in 2008, you could draw down the reserve so that we could level the level of services. So that's the type of idea I would like to uh, make sure that we, we implement. Um, in terms of raving revenues, I'm raising revenues, I'm going to be very clear. I am not a big fan of taxes, and that would absolutely be my very last resort. I really think there's things that could be cut. And I will work very closely with our working groups because they are the ones who is on the ground working every day to find out the fat or whatever uh, areas that we believe we could cut without seriously impacting the services to our residents. Um, county is huge. We got, uh, besides the, the healthcare system, we've got the courts, we've got the jails, uh, the sheriff's department. Uh, and so all these areas we really need to look at to come up with uh, the, the, the shortfall is not gonna be an easy job. And this is one time that I would say, uh, experience having served on the, on the council back in 2008 for me in, in Sunnyvale timeframe has certainly been helpful to uh, weather this storm. And you know what? We will have to make it do, make do, because for county budget, it has to be balanced. And so we will. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. And uh, we have another question on the county budget. And Mr. Lee, you're gonna take this one first. Sure. What county services do you believe should be privatized and which reserve for the county workforce with its higher salaries and benefits? And the second part of the question, can you cite examples when you voted in opposition of SEIU wage increase demands or voted to outsource services? Thank you. So first of all, I just want to uh, be, be uh, um, open uh, about this answer. Uh, in this race, I have been endorsed by SEIU as a sole uh, endorsement candidate in this race. And so I'm honored to receive their uh, support. Uh, for that, uh, and that I was out there uh, helping them picketing as well uh, outside uh, quite a few buildings during the time of this uh, uh, protest when the CIU was trying to get that negotiation being done. The strike lasted way too long, uh, and I truly do not believe this is how a county should be run. Uh, I think the relationship between the labor groups is so important, and along with of, of uh, the, the chamber side as well, SVO. And, and that's what I said earlier, is that I'm the only candidate that's been endorsed by both the chamber and labor, which is extremely unusual, especially for those who you know, live in San Jose for so long. You're either with one side, like Landeep, and you're or, or Dave Cohen. Uh, and I don't believe that. I really think that both sides need to be able to work together and have good relationship with both sides, because I have worked on, on all these issues together to find true solutions. Um, I am not a fan of privatization. When you say privatize and outsource something, what you are telling me is that you could pay less and then you get the same service. In life, I believe in what you get, what you pay for. And if you try to get somebody to outside to actually make some money out of it, and at the same time you think you get a better deal at the end, it doesn't work because the, ultimately the worker get paid much lower salary. So I, I don't believe that works. Uh, and yes, I, we do have SEIU uh, as well in Sunnyvale, and they've always supported me in my races because I've been able to keep labor peace. And I'm very honored to say that in my eight years on, on the council, we have never had a single strike in Sunnyvale. Uh, never walk out, never have the picket line to cross or to, 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 to fight for because we were able to avoid all that early on. And I think it's the building relationship, working together is the key. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chu, the county budget, I'll read it again for you. What county services do you believe should be privatized and which reserve for the county workforce with its higher salaries and benefits? And can you cite examples when you voted in opposition to SEIU wage increase demands or voted to outsource, outsource services? Uh, 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 can you hear me? I yes. unmute myself. All right, great. 
You know, uh, I, I'm not a fan of privatizing the, uh, the, the uh, government services, because the, uh, uh, but there are some exceptions. If we need some help uh, immediately, you know, if we don't have the talent, we may want to go out and uh, uh, temporarily relieve some of the responsibility. Outside of an example, you know, when I was on the San Jose City Council, we're uh, working on, on pretty much overhaul the water treatment plant. At that time, uh, we don't have enough uh, engineering uh, support at the city, so we have to go out to to uh, uh, get get a bit from the private sector to help us to uh, get that project going. Uh, with the condition that they will also bring some of their expertise into our uh, uh, city. And uh, another uh, example is that during this uh, pandemic, we know that the state EDD uh, does not have the uh, ability uh, or the capacity to handle the, all the sudden increase of those uh, unemployment claims. So we contracted out to Verizon you know, we use their uh, facility, we use their uh, um, a staff to help answering the call. So, um, but in general uh, speaking, I don't believe in, in, in privatization, but there are a lot of uh, exceptions. Uh, at SEIU, uh, I think the one thing I know that because when they were, when it's county of trying to get the two hospitals and the SEIU insists that the county will pay for their tenure, to pay for their retirement. And I believe it's more important for the county to acquire those two hospitals because we, after San Jose Hospital closed, we're really, really short of hospitals back. So, um, and, and when the pandemic hit, it becomes so obvious that we have to convert the Santa Clara Convention Center into a, 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 a hospital a setting. So um, okay, it, it's so really- I'm have to cut you oh, off there. You. Sorry. Our, our two minutes. Um, and what I will do, uh, if you can watch, I'll put up the 30 second sign. That's the same token. Uh, since you had the, the last question, you have the first one. You'll be the first one to go to our oh, next question. Okay. And here's our question. Do you agree with the steps the county has taken to safely reopen businesses? And if not, what would you have done differently? You know, to, uh, the, I pretty much agree uh, with, with the step that the uh, county has been taken. Uh, they really rely on the data, we rely on the expert to, to make the decision. But I feel that uh, the, the state or the, the federal government uh, are in a better position to, to uh, come out with the strict guideline for every businesses. And so we be able to follow a CDC guideline when we uh, uh, thinking about or considering the, the risk. And uh, so a county, I know, uh, is trying their best, but uh, with the resources and, and everything else, um, uh, I, they, they, they not developing uh, the guideline for every uh, businesses. So that's uh, uh, s uh, something that we might need to work closely with the state or even the federal government to be able to have a, a uniform guideline throughout different uh, counties in the state. And so the business can follow the guideline and reopen and uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, support, bring the food back to the to, to their family and also uh, increase the sales tax for our uh, county, our school, and our city. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lee, I'm gonna read it again for you. Do you agree with the steps the county has taken to safely reopen businesses? And if not, what would you have done differently? Thank you. Um, 
I think overall our county has done well in terms of the uh, COVID initial res uh, response, which was to have to do the shelter in place uh, quite early on. We were way earlier than New York City, and certainly you could see what benefits we have received versus what happens in New York and other places. Uh, as far as the opening uh, thereafter, uh, unfortunately, I think they were a bit too haphazard. Honestly, there was not enough notices for a lot of businesses when they start these reopening. Um, with only like 72 hour notice for people to suddenly, wow, we've been open. And if you recall some of the businesses that open like nail salon the first time around uh, or gym had to shut down in like three days because of the, 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 the fact that the numbers actually went back up again. And it's really devastating for some of these hair salon and places because people thought, oh my God, we've been gone for so many months, we open up and now you shut us down in two, three days. How are we gonna survive? And now that we reopen again this time around, we're seeing the impact that the first time around, there were a lot of uh, appointments that were being made because people were dying to get the haircut. Uh, but now this time around, people have changed uh, and, and they're seeing the business not as strong as the first time around. So I really think the reopening needs to be a lot stronger. We need to be much better prepared. Another point I want to make is the, the issue of the masks. I really do think the masking uh, mandate that was trying to be passed uh, was a bit late. I really think that should have been, been implemented a lot sooner because after all, I truly believe that mask is one of the best ways to help us get our freedom back. Uh, I wrote an op-ed basically saying that mask is the uh, our key uh, because of the fact that uh, as much as you can do to whatever social distancing you want to do, wash your hands, it turns out that mask is something that if everybody wears it, if 100% of our, our, our residents wear it, I really do think our economy can open a lot sooner. I was born in Hong Kong and in Hong Kong, a place of 7 million people, less than 10 people die from COVID. Now, how could that be the case? A place that's so small and all how to social distance. Well, because of the fact that 99 plus percent of people wear masks over there. And they actually did not even have to shut down the economy, which is amazing. Uh, so I really do think that those are the things that we, the county could have done or should have done to help us reopen a lot sooner. Okay, thank okay. you, Mr. Lee. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Lee, uh, uh, you're gonna have the, the take the first shot at the next question dealing with the COVID-19 yeah. scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that the current Board of Supervisors, the public health officer, have managed the COVID-19 crisis well to protect our communities? If yes, why? And if not, why not? Thank you. Um, it's a, almost like a, a continuation of the last question, right? So public health officer, Dr. Sarah Cody, now of course become a uh, almost a celebrity, not just in our county, but uh, uh, in our country, because of the fact that we have come up with the shelter in place so early on in March. Uh, why is that important? As we all know, the sooner you, you do the shelter in place, the sooner you put a, a stop, or at least slow down the, the flattening the curve, right? So we have been able to do that very, very quickly, uh, unlike other places and other states. And I think due to that, uh, uh, Santa Clara County, based on the number of population, we actually have some of the lowest numbers, especially compared to Southern California. We talk about Imperial County or LA County, our numbers are far, far better. Uh, is that enough? It's not good enough? I, I don't think it's ever good enough. We, we shouldn't have these type of uh, uh, deaths and, and, and COVID cases. And one of the things that you also see is the impact uh, of COVID. The four zip codes on the east side in San Jose has the highest number of deaths and infection rate, which affected a lot of the African-American and Latinx community very dramatically. And this is also the most vulnerable communities that we have known all along from school issues. Uh, and many of you have been involved. I know uh, 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 Dr. Hector, you were your superintendent. You know those school issues and what the need is in that community has been so devastated. And I've been telling people, you know, we are in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. And we really could see it this time around that COVID has hurt us so desperately. Uh, and so that's why I think it is so important for our county's role to make sure that testing is not only free, but the easily obtainable for everybody, despite whatever the immigration status or the wealth, everybody should get tested whether they're insured or not, so that we could get people who needs help as soon as possible. And testing has to be frequent. And in order to have that, and also the availability of gloves and masks, those really should be freely distributed in order to uh, stop this epidemic. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
do you think the current Board of Supervisors and the public health officer have managed the COVID-19 crisis well to protect our communities? If yes, why? And if not, why not? You know, I, I will say that they're, they're, they're doing the best that they can. I will give them definitely an A. Uh, a lot of the issue really cannot be addressed at the county level. You're talking about the, the mask. You know, at the beginning of this pandemic, the, uh, the, uh, our state allocated $55 billion, you know, trying to have a, 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 a stock up the PPEs. You know, I personally uh, have collected a donation for 100,000 masks and donated to the, the regional hospital as the BMC and stuff like that. There was a, such a shortage in the national stockpile for those PPEs. And uh, uh, the, the, the state have to use some, some of our uh, money to buy those PPEs to, to provide to the uh, frontline workers. Even today, some of the uh, community clinic are still calling me and to ask me if I'd be able to help them uh, uh, collect some um, PPE equipment. So from the county perspective, I think they are do, really doing uh, the, 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 the best they can. You're talking about the testing, the turnaround time, the, the, the lack of the the, uh, the 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 swapped or the and and the, the, it was really uh, jeopardized that this issue. So we would not be able to get those uh, tests and the resolve back immediately. So we'd be able to do some uh, uh, contact tracing. I think the contact tracing is very very important and the disparity of the services. Uh, provided in the east side. Two of the, the zip codes are actually in my district. It, it is devastating. And that's why Council Member Magdalena Carrasco and I started a, a health equity task force. We have uh, came out with uh, 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 10, 12 suggestions we provided to the county, the city, and I have written the letter to the governor at the state level as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, you're going to start us off, uh, Mr. Chu, in our next section. We're going to change the topic. We're going to go over and we're going to address crime uh, and justice. Do you think our community jails are being run effectively? If not, what have been some of the problems and what would you do to fix them? And also, as a third piece of this question, what public safety reforms have you advocated for in the past and will you support moving forward? Yeah, our, our jail, uh, jail system is undergoing uh, uh, some uh, reform. There is a Blue Ribbon Task Force uh, and uh, Sheriff Laura Smith, uh, I know, is working really, really hard to, 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 to make it, to comply with the uh, Blue uh, Ribbon uh, uh, Task Force uh, uh, recommendation. And um, there's always a room for improvement you know, and, and, and the government. And I would definitely uh, open to any suggestions from the expert, you know, uh, including those people in the Blue Ribbon Task Force to make sure that uh, our jail is uh, run um, it, it, it efficiently and uh, to the best of, of our ability. I think in, in terms of this uh, criminal justice system, I like to see more money uh, to allocate it for those people that got relieved from the uh, uh, incarceration from the jail, and would we'll be able to help them uh, to get their feet back on the uh, on, on the ground. You know, to address some of the uh, the mental health issues or drug uh, addiction issue, and, and instead of just letting them go uh, 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 out on the street. You know, as a state assembly member, I'd be able to secure um, with, with about uh, $15 million uh, last year to address the, um, the, the, the car breaking issues. And uh, uh, what, the money was uh, uh, spent on five uh, different police departments because it's regional issues. And we we put a dent into uh, this problem, but then the pandemic hit, and so I will not be able to 
uh, get additional money to address those issues. And in terms of uh, uh, the police reform and justice reform, I think we just have to have a more open and accountable police department. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chu. Um, crime and justice, Mr. Lee. Uh, do you think our current, our, our county jails are being run effectively? And if not, what would have been some of the problems uh, and what would you do to fix them? Also, what public safety reforms have you advocated for in the past and will you support going forward? Well, for one thing, this question certainly uh, will last more than two minutes to answer, but I'll try to do my best, uh, at least on the jail reform part. Uh, after Michael Tyree was beat to death by three of our uh, jail guards in the county, the county formed a blue ribbon committee on custodial operations. Uh, I was one of the commissioners appointed by Supervisor Dave Cotetti to serve on it, which was a six month assignment. Every Saturday for two to four hours, we were listening to these very amazing horror stories directly from the inmates and also sheriff deputies and also the jail uh, operators to find out what all the issues are. And one of the things that we've learned that was really amazing was that we used to, we have this uh, mental health floor on the very top floor of the main jail, of which at that time, we were insourcing, we were taking inmates who've got mental health problems from two other counties. And so, because that's good revenue for us, right? But the problem with that is that when it's full, we have moved inmates that does not belong anywhere else but in the mental health setting downstairs, which is where the general population was. And Michael Tyree was one of those who got moved, who eventually, of course, acting up and was, was beat to death. The three jail, jail uh, guards, of course, did get charged eventually and uh, was, uh, was in, in, in trial. But the point I'm trying to make here is that we really need to make sure that our mental health system for our jail is not run like any other uh, jail. In other words, we really need mental health professionals to deal with folks who have mental health and not just somebody who is untrained like this case. And so that was the number one issue. We also identified so many issues. We have over 100 recommendations that was voted basically unanimously by all the commissioners, of which to date, less than a third has been implemented. And so as your county supervisor, I will make sure that those recommendations is being looked at with a good oversight to make sure that they really truly get implemented for our residents. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, thank you, uh, Mr. Lee. You will have the next question here dealing with crime and justice. Uh, the Berryessa Hills uh, area is patrolled by the County Sheriff Department, and the San Jose Police Department is rarely observed up there for, the, uh, for San Jose property. The county has the CHP handle all traffic issues up there. The CHP response time is unacceptable, and these county areas are not protected by consistent law enforcement. The amount of increased traffic, speeding, throwing trash, and illegal parked vehicles, which is uh, as much as 12,000 vehicles, uh, uh, 12,000 vehicles during a weekend, going up to this Vista Ridge. How would you address this issue? That's right. Um, the San Jose PD certainly needs to step up to do more. Right, but at the end of the day, it's a public safety is not something that only one agency or the other agency. It really is a regional approach that we need so that we could work better together. Um, we've got park rangers for the county that uh, also look at some of the park areas, and I think that whether it's the park rangers, whether it's the police, whether it's the deputy, the sheriff deputies, we really need to make sure that. These guys are coordinated up there. Number one, number two is as far as speeding concern, that to me is actually one of the easier way to do. Uh, certainly speed bumps is something that people have installed to make sure people are not going out there you know, driving crazy and we've seen those. Uh, and being Silicon Valley, I certainly think that there are ways that we could put those uh, speed monitor devices out there that take pictures. Uh, and so when, as we all have experienced, as soon as you know there's a radar, uh, uh, taking pictures, measuring your speed, people slow down. Nobody wants to get a ticket. And I think those are the things that we could do instead of sending people up there necessarily, we could have them monitor basically 24 seven. Uh, so these are some of the 
quicker or simple ideas I want to Im implement. And of course, once you bring in some cameras, uh, the, the folks who's up to no good tend to behave much better in front of the camera. So I do think that uh, the, the speed monitoring in those areas is definitely necessary. And I think the funding of getting those equipment is something that the Sheriff's Department, the County Sheriff's Office and the San Jose PD certainly could work together uh, to, to make that happen. Uh, at the end of the day, um, we do need more folks up there. And I've seen actually from the San Jose Police Department, they have those not police officer, but they have these kind of community services officers that actually up there are, are checking people going up the hills, like, what are you doing up there? Uh, you know, so are you going up there doing fireworks or up to no good? So when having folks being posted there, I think it certainly has helped uh, minimize uh, the type of issues. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chu, Crime and Justice. The Berryessa Hills uh, area is patrolled by the County Sheriff's Department and the San Jose PD is rarely observed up there for San, Jose, uh, for San Jose property. The county has the CHP handle all traffic issues up there. The CHP response time is unacceptable and these county areas are not protected by consistent law enforcement. The amount of increased traffic, uh, speeding, throwing trash and illegal parked vehicles with as much as 12,000 vehicles during a weekend going up to Vista Ridge. How would you address this issue? Well, th thank you very much for the question. Uh, am I I'm muted? All right, great, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. The speed bump is not the solution because it will jeopardize when there is a fire and the fire engine will not be able to get as Possibly can, uh, but uh, you, uh, Mr. Chu, uh, Jansen, I just paused. Contact equipment result. I'm sorry. Okay, Jansen, I just yes. I paused you at a oh, minute thirty-seven you seconds because you started to break up. I could barely oh, hear really? you. Yes, I, 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 I'm sorry. You know. This is so uh, when you're living in the east side, uh, the, the Wi Fi could be spotty. But right. I'm saying that the, the speed bump is not a solution because it could be a, a slow down the fire response and the emergency response. Uh, so, uh, but some high tech devices uh, uh, with respect of the uh, of not intrigued on the personal uh, uh, privacy is something that we could con consider. <laughs> I think the reason, or well, one one of the solution, uh, is to increase uh, the uh, uh, the human services or the uh, the social services uh, 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 the department, so we can free some of the peace officers from uh, doing some uh, you know uh, 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 like a, a homeless shelter, a ho a homeless encampment or calling the police to get rid of some homeless people in the shopping center. And those should be taken care of by the social services people. And then if we have enough social services people on call 24 hours a, a, a day, then we should be able to free up some of those peace officers to do what they're really supposed to be doing. You know, uh, uh, go after those speeders, or uh, there's a litter, uh, litters and so on and so forth. So uh, that that's what is something uh, that I will be advocating for: increasing more social services, in beefing up that department. Okay, thank you. And you're going to take the next one, Mr. Chu here, and we're still dealing with crime and justice. Twenty percent of inmates in the county jail suffer from severe mental illness. 50% of the inmates in the county jail suffer, suffer from mental health issues. The average inmate population is 4,000. The county is constructing a new main jail to accommodate mentally ill inmates who return to the streets upon release. The county has not increased any in any acute mental health facilities, licensed residential facilities, or licensed residential homes. What are your thoughts and beliefs on how to support this population? Uh, th this is an uh, th th excellent question. You know, my, uh, I started my public services uh, serving on the county 
a mental health board for six years. So I'm, I'm really, really aware of the uh, problem that you, you just described. You know, when there's a budget cut, mental health is usually the, 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 the first one in the chopping block because people don't see that uh, mental health is a life or death issue, which I totally disagree. You know, we have a lot of uh, a suicide, we have a, a, a lot of murders, all caused by the mental illness of the people. So I, in, in the, the, the state assembly, I have proposed bills uh, to, to have a mental health professionals in every public school of California at a ratio of one to 400 students. I think that issue, we need to address them when they were younger, when they, uh, and, and, and provide services where it's the most convenience to, to their families. 85% of the uh, uh, students in California that require mental health services don't have access to it. So mental health, uh, uh, providing better as, access to mental health services is definitely what I will be advocating from. Thank you. Mr. Lee, crime and justice. 20% of inmates in the county jail suffer from severe mental illness. 50% of the inmates in the county jail suffer from mental health issues. The average inmate population is 4,000. The county is constructing a new main jail to accommodate mentally ill inmates who return to the street upon release. The county has not increased in um, any acute uh, mental health facilities, licensed residential facilities, or licensed residential homes. What are your thoughts and beliefs on how to support this population? Thank you, Will. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the top floor of the main jail is for the mental health floor. And we, since the, the recommendation from the Blue Ribbon Commission, that insourcing of mental health inmates from other county has already stopped. So that's a good start. So we need, to need those beds back for our own residents here in Santa Clara County. But that's, of course, it's just a very uh, slow beginning. At the end of the day, when we are sending police out to deal with homeless issues or mental, and many of those who are also mental illness issues, we understand one thing, homelessness and mental illness is not a crime. Police deals with criminals. The, the fact that we're using police for these services is a complete mismatch of the skill sets. And that's what's causing a lot of the problems that we've seen these days on our streets. Uh, charging homeless or folks with mental illness and putting them in jail for a night and then releasing the next day, it just doesn't work. That's not what police is for. It's not humane. It's not civilized. And being Silicon Valley, as rich as we are, with you know, Google, Intel, we really need to do better in Google. We need to do way better. And I really do believe we need a significant increase of the funding being allocated to getting mental health professionals, social workers, and counselors to our system to, to give these uh, individuals who need mental health counseling and treatment. Uh, and this is truly the way to get us out of this, this problem. I do believe many of those who are in, in, in incarcerated, as you mentioned, the 4,000, uh, can be significantly reduced when we actually properly put them where they're supposed to be to getting the treatment they need. The cost of incarceration is very, very high. We're cl clocking about close to $70,000 for inmate per year. Uh, this is really a horrible way of spending money. When people really need uh, treatment, give them the treatment, it's a lot cheaper so they can lead, lead a better life. And increasing uh, other beds and for, for those residents is exactly the way to go. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Chu, um, we're going to, no, actually, take that back, uh, Mr. Lee. We're changing the topic. We're going to move over to development. Right. County residents and property owners contribute a high amount of property taxes, and yet the county does not provide storm drains, sidewalks, or completed paved streets for these property owners. How will you address these concerns? Uh, that's a great question. Um, the property tax uh, that the county has been receiving certainly has been increasing quite quickly for a few reasons. Number one is since we have been 
building a lot of housing and the cost of our build uh, housing <coughs> certainly has been going up through the roof. Uh, due to Prop 13, certainly it's only limited to 2% per year, but every time when you have new buildings being built or there's a property transfer, the jump of property tax there is quite significant. And so for that, that's why we were able to have that huge uh, budget that we talk about over $8.1 billion uh, of a budget of a county. Uh, I do believe that as uh, for residents, uh, things like paving the streets or storm surface. Now, obviously, if you live in the city jurisdiction, the street paving, right, those are all paid for by the city services. Uh, but if you're in an incorporated area, that's where you do not get those paved streets. So in this case, also the storm drains that you talk about. I do believe there are areas uh, where the county should do more to provide it since after we are collecting the taxes for it. So I'm open to ideas, especially, I guess, one of the more uh, kind of in the incorporated area, but with, you know, there's actually more traffic, uh, foot traffic, that we want people to be walking safely with the lights and pay street. So I'm, I'm certainly open to the idea. As far as storm drains concerned, I think it's important uh, to make sure that it actually get properly funded uh, because we certainly don't want it to be backed up and causing flooding. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chu, dealing with development. County residents and property owners contribute a high amount of property taxes, and yet the county does not provide storm drains, sidewalks, or completely uh, completed paved streets for these property owners. How will you address these concerns? That, that's really a good question. You know, the property tax, about 30% of them go to the county, and about 60% uh, 30%, about 60% yeah, about go to the school, and about 20-some percent go to the county, and then the other 20-some uh, percent will go to the city. So it, it's just really being a traditional uh, uh, service that the uh, uh, city provide uh, the, the sidewalk, because uh, they kind of got the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, city service uh, boundary where they have agreement with the utility company or where to, to not you know, uh, bury their pipes and, and, and the wires and so on and so forth. But the, um, the sidewalk, it, it is a really to, a very important issue, you know, as we're encouraging people to, to really get out, out of their house and do more exercise and and the uh, the the I I will definitely look into the, this issue. I I think the reason that uh, we just never have done that is because the, the 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 houses are much further apart in this in the county property. So uh, the 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 cost of connecting them is is probably a, a biggest concern. But we could definitely can use some of the trail money and, and to uh, uh, pave some uh, sidewalks and, and the, um, so to provide that, that services to the county residents, that, that uh, those residents that live outside of the city boundary. There, there should wish to look for some other funding uh, sources. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chu. Our second question dealing with development. How should the cities and county work together to ensure sensible growth and development policies in Santa Clara County? What projects have you supported and what projects do you oppose? The, I mean, this is when, when the government work together, the, 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 you will really uh, have, yield the best result for the residents. You know, the, the uh, county currently has all the expressways and we'll want to make sure that uh, they were very well maintained because they serve as an artery for so many of the city uh, um, um, uh, residents, you know, and, and what I'd like to see that the, the uh, county could get more involved in providing uh, in, by better uh, transportation, you know, we're talking about a sidewalk and that's uh, good for biking and, and safe for the bikers and, and also work closely with the BTA 
uh, on many of the, the, the transportation issue. Uh, uh, so far, I don't uh, see there, there, there seems to be working very well. Uh, just on top of my head, I cannot think of one incident that the county and the city are at odds with each other, but I will definitely continue foster that relationship uh, from, from the county, not just to the city, but also to the state, because county is really just a branch of the state uh, a government. You know, uh, they're, they're mostly uh, responsible for the human services. And I was very honored to serve at the Assembly Human Services Committee as a chairperson for two years. So uh, I will definitely build upon the relationship I have in, in the uh, state and continuing drawing more resources for the county. Okay, thank you. Okay, moving on, Mr. Lee. How should thank the you. cities and county work together to ensure sensible growth and development policies in Santa Clara County? What projects have you uh, supported and what projects do you oppose? Yes, I think the uh, balanced growth is very important and I'm very uh, adamant to make sure that it's what we call smart growth. So we need to do more urban sprawl. Uh, build, you know, putting more housing on the hillside uh, does not make sense, especially when you see all the fire risk, uh, that as well, plus all the pollution and additional traffic from that type of uh, building. We need to build more housing, but we need to build smart. So what I mean by that is you need high density on places where there's transportation hub, like the bar stations and downtown area to discourage these additional car traffic to jam our uh, roadways. Um, as we have all uh, experienced, uh, the traffic has, has gone really bad uh, until most recently with COVID. Uh, and the area that the county has jurisdiction on is the county expressway, your Lawrence Expressway, your Capital Expressway. When you hear the word expressway, that means it's county's uh, roadway. And one of my big, big uh, proposal in my campaign here is having more rate separation, which is a fancy way of building more overpasses than the passes. When you see expressways, they were, these were built over 50 years ago when there aren't that many people down here in this Valley of Hearts of Light. It was okay, you know, at that time to plan, but what, what we're seeing right now is if you try to drive on Montague Expressway, you know it's nothing expressed about that road. <laughs> uh, unless you go in some, some odd hours, there's always traffic. And as a matter of fact, you could get stuck uh, between 880 and Montague for easily five minutes just to get across that 880. <clears throat> so having overpass on the pass in these areas is so important because all it takes is one light to really slow you down. Uh, and, and also for the safety of people, safety of cars or for bikes, uh, these type of uh, uh, great separation is long, long overdue. And this is something that I will push really hard for the county to, to, to pony up, to make sure that these uh, type of underpasses, overpasses are long-term projects, but they need to be planned, they need to be funded, they need to be built to keep our cars moving. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lee, we're going to change the subject. Mm -hmm. We've got to move over to one that's pretty sensitive to everyone in the area. We're talking about the homeless. COVID-19 has highlighted the importance of people having a housing unit to safely shelter in place. The county fairgrounds is a temporary homeless shelter site during the pandemic. What would your proposed housing transition plan be for the people currently housed at this temporary shelter? Well, this is the, uh, the, the six million, probably say six billion dollar question. Uh, the county has already raised uh, through measure A, 950 million, close to a billion dollars on building uh, affordable housing. Uh, and it's something that is a great idea. The problem is its implementation. Uh, well over 60% of those funds still have not yet really been spent to be built, which is really, really unfortunate. <clears throat> and we really need to build them faster. I do think the red tape is one of the biggest problems we have in terms of building longer term housing. Temporary shelter is something we need urgently as well because we have folks on the streets that need needs housing. And I want to share a quick story uh, about myself. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I served in Iraq uh, for a year in uh, 2009. And during that year, I actually lived, myself lived in a 40 foot 
not the whole container, only live in one third of a 40 foot container. And this is what our US Army uh, put our soldiers in to live. It's true, no luxury, but guess what? It's got a roof, it's got a window, it's got a door that locks. It gave me the personal privacy and shelter that I needed. Uh, of course, there's also an AC unit to deal with the heat and the, and the coldness at night. And that's the type of idea I think we really need to bring our folks and take them off to supporting tiny homes, whether you support containerized housing. Uh, you know what? We really need all different type of solutions to be implemented quickly so that we could really get people off the streets. When you see this district in Berryessa for the past 10 years, the homeless problem has not gone any better. It's gone way worse. There are more folks on the, on the uh, underpass. There's more folks by the highway. There are more folks in the creeks. Uh, by the railroad tracks, um, those those disgusting situations we're seeing is inhumane. We really should not allow that to happen. And until we could get the shelter on in there, these home, homeless folks are not going to be any better than today. So this is something I've been very passionate about. I want to make sure to help solve these out. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chu, homeless. The COVID-19 has highlighted the importance of people having a housing unit to safely shelter in place. The county fairgrounds is a temporary homeless shelter site during the pandemic. What would you, your proposed housing transition plan be for the people currently housed in this temporary shelter? Yeah, that COVID-19 def definitely highlighted the income inequality in our uh, very wealthy Santa Clara County. So income inequality is really one of the top uh, issue that I wanted to be able to uh, 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 work on it when should I get elected to the supervisor. And uh, to solve the housing problem, to, we, or the homeless, homelessness problem, we need to find out why those people become homeless in the first place. You know, you run a gamut of those people, they, you know, trying to evade a, a domestic violence situation. The, uh, the wife the, or the husband just grab their kids and run out of the door, they become homeless immediately. And you have people working on two, three jobs, and if they lost one of the jobs, you know, they cannot afford the, 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 the rent or the, the mortgage payment, they become uh, homeless immediately too. All the, the other extreme, those people have the multiple barriers, you know, drug addict or mental health issues, and so on and so forth. So when we address the homeless, uh, the homelessness issue, we need. I will really wanted to have a uh, equity of the uh, money spent across the spectrum. You know, we will have some rapid rehousing for for those uh, people. Uh, and provide them a, a shelter and provide them an address and provide them the computer so they'd be able to uh, uh, go back to get another uh, a job and with an address and, and to be a, a productive uh, uh, members of our community. We have leased a lot of hot, uh, empty hotel motel rooms and to, to also uh, provide them with a transition. But the ADU and, and also the tiny homes and, and all of this, we, uh, the pr production of more housing uh, at the same time uh, preserve uh, some existing uh, tenant also, as well as uh, uh, prevention of the homeless and, uh, homelessness is, is the three prone approach that I will take. Okay, thank you. And since we were talking about the homeless, we're going to switch the topic over to housing, uh, Mr. Chu. Uh, with the countywide extension of the uh, eviction moratorium, what will you do as a supervisor to help alleviate financial burdens for property owners and the landlords? You know, to write, the, the, the landlord uh, currently, uh, you, you know, or anybody has a difficulty of paying their mortgage. And if your mortgage, is uh, uh, backed by the federal government, the Fannie Mae or the Freddie Mac, I would really encourage you to, to talk to, to your uh, lender to see if you can get a reprieve. 
And even uh, the, the uh, private uh, uh, banks, uh, some of them are giving out some of the, uh, some some reprieves. So we we'll definitely uh, encourage you to to contact your um, uh, uh, a banker or the mortgage company. You know, at this point, uh, because of the sudden um, increase of the uh, unemployment, uh, we we we're trying to trying to pr pr protect or prevent more people become homelessness. So that's a, a, a moratorium, but the moratorium is a temporary moratorium. You know, we, you, the, the tenants still have to pay 25% of the rent. I know it's not enough to pay for the, for the mortgage, but uh, the, the dealing with the, the mortgage bank, uh, banking issue is, is more of a federal government issue. And it's very, very difficult for even for the state to, 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 to pick up that responsibility. When I started the, this uh, uh, assembly session, we were anticipating $12 billion to $15 billion surplus in a, this year's budget. But when I left, uh, the, when we closed the session, we're dealing with $55 billion shortfall. And that, that, that's not, uh, uh, that's not uh, accounting for the, the federal government and funding. If they're the federal government will not come through with their funding in October, we may see another cut. So, the, and the banking is most, mostly uh, uh, controlled by the federal government. We Thank need to continue time. working with the, uh, our federal legislators. Okay, that's some kind of time on that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lee, we're talking about housing. And once again, with the countywide uh, extension of the eviction moratorium, what will you do as a supervisor to help alleviate the financial burdens for property owners as well as the landlords? Right. So um, as far as the eviction moratorium certainly is necessary under the COVID situation. So I am happy that it got extended. The problem here is a couple, one of which is the uh, whether there might be renters who is abusing the moratorium. Uh, for those who actually can, like they are fully uh, employed, uh, and that they actually are, they're financially they're actually doing well, but they're trying to use the moratorium to not pay rent for months and months. Uh, after, as we know, with one month's deposit, right, what good is that when these folks are looking for as long as they can, and as soon as the moratorium is over, they just leave on their own. Uh, technically, legally, they're still responsible, but, you know, then the landlord is certainly gets stiff, right? So I think there are, there are, ways that we could try to make sure that the folks who are truly needed are the ones who is getting the, 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 the situation handled. And I do think there are mechanisms being built in that you need to you know, provide the fact that you have lost your income, uh, that, uh, that you really can pay and therefore uh, you won't be evicted because of that. Number one, second thing is I think to ease the landlord's pain, one of the big issues of course is property tax, which is a county uh, jurisdiction. Uh, and I'm, I'm big, fan of making sure that, for example, we charge late fee for paying your, uh, your property tax. Uh, I think that should be something that should be waivable at this time, given the, the fact that it's very difficult to, to make ends meet. And I do believe that uh, we should consider providing certain type of grants for landlord who has uh, demonstrated that they, uh, they have a significant loss of income due to people not paying the mortgage and something like that I think would be helpful to help because after we the federal government has done the PPP uh, even city of San, uh, Sunnyvale and San Jose has, has come up with certain type of grant programs for small businesses and many people the landlords that is their business right that I do believe that uh, they should also be able to get some relief upon demonstrated the need that of the significant loss of income that uh, some type of grants would be able to help them tie over so that they could at least meet their mortgage uh, mortgage obligation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hey, Mr. Lee, we're gonna move over, change it up again. We're gonna talk a little bit about outreach and accessibility. Sure. How do you plan to communicate with District 3 citizens? And secondly, will you or your staff attend every Various Citizen Advisory Council general meeting. Right. So we talked about District 3, right? It's a really large area. We talked about North Sunnyvale, North Peters, Berryessa, the East 
foothill side and also uh, evergreen. And I think this is an area where you really can't uh, one size fits all to solve the different communities issues. And one of the things I would do as your supervisor is to make sure that on my staff, there will be individual staff member that all from each of the districts so that they actually knows what happens on the ground because every district is certainly different have their own character, number one. Number two is the language outreach should be just as important because there's so many different languages spoken uh, besides Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, Tagalog, there's still so many other languages also spoken in this area as well. So I would definitely want to make sure that uh, staff members are hired with the language capability to outreach and discuss to our residents in their own tongue. I may not be able to cover every single language, but for the languages I mentioned, I do believe we'll be able to do that. I myself speak three Chinese dialects, Cantonese, Mandarin, and Shanghai dialect, uh, and also Spanish. And I think those would be ways that I could talk to my constituents directly and have been able to do that and solve some of the problems. When I was in Sunnyvale City Council quite a few times, uh, residents would speak those languages, would come up and study staff just look at each other and say, look at me, it's like, Otto, can you help? And, and I just jump up and go ahead and do whatever translations needed. And I do expect that to on my staff members that they can be able to do that as well. Um, promising to go to BCC meetings? Absolutely because this is exactly how we get information, what's happening on the ground. So I think to me, having at least one member attending BCAC meeting is a requirement. And, and myself, uh, to be your supervisor, I will promise to be attending those meetings at least three, four times a year, if not more frequently, because that's the only way I know what's going on on the ground. And, and I would be honored if you um, trust me for that responsibility. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chu, Outreach and Access. How do you plan to communicate with District 3 citizens? And will you or your staff attend every various Citizens Advisory Council general meeting? Well, when, uh, I'm uh, very proud to be a member of the BCAC for over 20 years. And when I was on the San Jose City Council, I think both Stacy and I, well, try to attend every one of the BCAC meeting and even uh, as an assembly member, I remember driving back home to attend some of the uh, uh, meetings and, and, and uh, to really uh, uh, keep me uh, informed about what's going on with the BCAC. And this BCAC, like I said in the beginning, was really, really uh, uh, did a wonderful job of empowering our citizens and also uh, get them uh, involved and get them informed. Uh, when I was on the San Jose City Council, I have this uh, community uh, business hour. You know that you uh, every week I will go to uh, the the library study rooms or, or sometimes even on the Starbucks in the evening, uh, so people can bring their issue uh, to me instead of uh, worry about taking time off during the day and go to downtown and to 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 meet me. And uh, when I got elected to the assembly, I keep that, you know, this community office hour. I covered uh, two, uh, two counties, you know, five different cities, but I, I just rotating them and, and have the opportunity to, to meet with uh, uh, more of the residents and to have a one-on-one -on -one communication uh, with them to be able to help them with a lot of their uh, issues. So I definitely will consider uh, doing that. That's really, to me, the highlight of my public services, to be able to uh, uh, con connect with the, the residents and help them to solve their problems. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Chu, we're going to move over to the second uh, question. Now that the board has adopted online meetings due to the COVID restrictions, would you be in favor of holding online board meetings or on Saturdays to accommodate citizens whose uh, jobs preclude them from attending on work days? That, definitely. I mean, the, it's, it's really a good uh, a suggestion. You know, when, when we were in the San Jose City Council member, we're trying to uh, move all those uh, uh, public uh, uh, related issue to the evening 
so people be able to uh, come and address uh, uh, the, 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 the council on, on uh, what, what their concern and, and their and issue. So uh, moving to uh, Saturday is, is a great idea, you know, uh, it's, uh, as I was uh, elected to city council, um, I n never take in uh, a weekend off. It's, it's a seven day, 24 hours uh, j a job. So to be able to host the, the, the meeting either online or in person on Saturday, as it, it's, a, it's a great idea. We need to adjust the, uh, the working hour. So we will not have to pay the staff uh, an, uh, overtime. And because this is a very challenging time financially for every, any level of government, you know, and uh, uh, we, we will all have to be mindful of uh, uh, what, what was the additional cost of uh, having those meetings on the weekend. Great idea. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Lee, outreach and access. Now that the board has adopted online meetings due to the COVID restrictions, would you be in favor of holding online board meetings or on Saturday to accommodate citizens whose jobs preclude attendance on work day? Um, the online board meeting certainly is uh, less personal, but I think it also uh, makes it easier for many more people to attend the board meeting. So I think it actually uh, has some benefits uh, due to COVID. We have to do them online. Uh, so one thing I do mention regarding meetings is that uh, when I was in Sunnyvale Council, there are times some of the meetings that went past 11 p.m. or midnight. Uh, I remember voting for downtown project to like 2.30 a.m. in the morning. And frankly, uh, I honestly say that no, no many good decisions are being made past 11 p.m. Let's go back to number one. Number two is uh, I have seen people arguing yes and voting no because they are so tired and so confused once it's that late. And I think some of us have been there, know what I'm talking about. And so I think it's truly uh, an injustice to the citizenry when we are having these type of meetings at times where people have to go to work the next day. And I even argue that there's no longer really an open meeting when you have these hours that people cannot show up to. Uh, some council would try to put very controversial issues at the very end of the agenda. So by then most people can last as long, they have to go home and so they could get these things passed. So this is what we absolutely cannot do, right? For a meeting to be open, you need it to be a reasonable time that more people could participate. And so by the same token, when you say about Saturdays, well, actually, guess what? When I was on the Blue Ribbon uh, Custodial um, Reform Commit Mission, uh, we were meeting nine o'clock on Saturday morning to listen to the issues regarding jail reforms and the inmates and the, and the, and the law enforcement. Uh, and it's really uh, enlightening. And we get to actually see so many different people coming to the meetings because it's not a work day. And we, if we run a little bit over till like, Instead of noon to 1 p.m., it's not a big deal. Everybody's still awake. We just haven't had lunch yet, uh, but we certainly get a lot of good input. So I do believe that Saturday is a great idea. I, I certainly do think that if that encourages more people, uh, more citizenry uh, participation, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to change the topic once again. We're going to talk about policy and law. Uh, Mr. Lee, you're going to go first on this. Sure. What is your position on removing the quote, state cannot discriminate against or grant preferential treatment on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in the operation of public employment, public education, or public contracting, called for in Proposition 16, the repeal of affirmative action. So affirmative action was imposed or been adopted uh, in our state all the way until the 1990s, and it's been removed under Proposition 209. Since the adoption of Proposition 209 without affirmative action, the number of African-American Latinx students in our schools has dropped significantly in terms of percentages. Today, with close to 40% Latinos, Latinx living in the state of California, less than 25% of CSU and UC students are Latinx. It's a system that is truly not equitable. The so-called equality or e the, 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 the facial equality that we're looking at that's being said is really hurting our 
Latinx students and the Black African American students, and even some Asian students as well. Uh, and of course, well, for the Prop 16 also covers women, uh, gender equity as well. Therefore, for those reasons, and the fact that I myself am a product of a firm faction, I went to Hastings Law School, and I was one of the students that received uh, the LEOP, Legal Education Opportunity Program, which allowed me not to get into school, but also the one full year of extra tutoring on all my subjects, contracts and torts and criminal law. And those are the things that actually helped me write better and helped me actually graduate from law school and pass the bar the first time. It's absolutely important to our students, whether they're second language learner, whether they're of the minority community disadvantaged for financial, whatever reasons they have and non-gender. That's why I am a strong, strong supporter of Proposition 16. And I have actually written an op-ed on the Mercury News explaining my positions, uh, why this is a very important issue of equity. In the age of the social unrest that we're seeing due to these racial racism and, and systemic racism we are seeing, um, this is the time that we absolutely need to bring that back to help our students, not just again to school, to get them to make them succeed, getting the, the contracts and employment is needed fairly. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chu, policy and law. What is your position on removing the state cannot discriminate against or grant preferential treatment on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin and the operation of public employment, public education, and public contracting. Call for in Proposition 16, the repeal of affirmative action. You mute it, Mr. Chu. All right. Yeah, this issue has been debated in, in Sacramento for seven years. I first introduced as SCA5 uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Hernandez in two. 2013, and, and, and so it, it never died in, in Sacramento. We, we've been debated uh, for the last uh, six, seven years. In my position always to have provide equal access to those uh, uh, d disadvantaged communities, we have to address the income inequality. You know, if you look at the, the studies, you know, there's a one called Opportunity for All co Coalition. It will tell you that the ACA5 is negatively impacted the, uh, the Asian American community. So it depends on uh, what, what there, there's so many reasons to op oppose it or to support it. But my work in the assembly is always trying to first improve the K-12 or pk to 12 education. And secondly, reduce the college cost, the cost of going to college. Right now, if you send a student to, to, to UC Berkeley, you know, including their living expenses, an average about 30,000 a year. So for four years, if they can graduate in four years, that's 120,000 total. How, you know, not, all those disadvantaged students that we're trying to help really have those financial uh, ability. You know, when my daughter graduated from uh, high school, you know, we just cannot af afford her to send her to, to, to uh, UC Berkeley. We're trying to talk her into getting to the two-year uh, uh, community college, but she doesn't want her to go through the college application again. So she ended up uh, uh, compromised and we uh, uh, graduated from San Jose State University. So income inequality is really, really the biggest barrier to uh, uh, equal access. We've been trying to uh, allocate $100 million when De Devin De uh, Kevin DeLeon was on the uh, Senate Pro 10 just to, for the in low income scholarship. I think we need to continue that. I, will not, I didn't support it in the, on the uh, assembly floor because there's no money in, in, in that bill. So we might end up just be able to benefit those okay. people that, who have and not those people have who, summarize that up who have not. Okay, thank you. And then since you have the floor, um, we're still talking about policy and law, Mr. Chu. Um, we're gonna go, what is your position? Will. 
Yes. I want you to stop for a second. Yes. We've been uh, doing this for an hour and 15 minutes. Um, we don't have to get out of the building, so we don't have to worry about the community center, but we've only covered like 14 questions. Uh, do we want to continue on? How much longer do we want to? Are the candidates willing to stay on for a while longer? I think we need to figure that out because it's eight, it's 8.30, yeah. I was just taking inventory. We're, we're looking at two. Yeah, there should be about seven more. Yeah, we got six, well, seven questions total. Right. Uh, at, at two, that's uh, 14. So we've got almost a half hour more. Yes. Uh, so, what, Will, what are the, um, the general areas and issues yet to be discussed? What, what are those topics? Maybe well, we can decide. The next one was, was dealing with uh, policy and law and positions on Prop 13. Okay. Uh, and Prop 15 for the split road tax. And then we have public safety. And we're talking about the Sheriff's Department funding and staffing levels, as well as... Um, uh, ah, good. The budget. I think some of those can be like the split roll tax, that proposition, maybe like a yes or no rather than a long, lengthy answer, right? Do you think? Well, I'll tell you what I can do. This is what I'll do. If you shorten there, it, maybe we can there, shorten there's two uh, a public minute. Safety, there's two in transportation. I'll just ask one of each. Yeah, that's a good idea. I agree. Oh, that's, that's good. good. Okay. But some of them are kind of duplicate, I mean, they're, they overlap. Yeah. Uh, Kenneth, are you guys are you guys okay with that? Oh, yeah. I'm I'm fine. Okay. We, we yeah. should respect people's times because Zoom <laughs> these Zoom meetings could go on forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what fine. I was getting concerned about. Yeah. Right on. And yeah, nobody's had a service break at this point as well. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to uh, switch over here to uh, public safety, and I believe uh, Mr. Chu, you have to you have the floor here. So um, what is your commitment regarding the Sheriff's Department funding and staffing levels? Are you aligned with defunding law enforcement or will you work to ensure the Sheriff's staff grows uh, in concert with our population? You know, I definitely believe that the Sheriff's Department need additional funding. You know, we, we need to really be able to uh, uh, get the best a, a police a practice uh, in place and to that would require some funding to train the sheriff the peace officer to uh, for for the new standard to for, for for the new procedure for the new process so i'm not definitely not uh, uh supporting it quote defunding the the, the police department and I think this is, if nothing else, is the time that we need to provide additional funding, not just for the police department, but also for the social services department, so we can have more social workers out there to do some of the job that the peace officer is doing right now. Okay, thank you. I, I'm very, uh, it's kind of a biased uh, uh, answer because uh, um, I'm, uh, endorsed by the Sheriff Laura Smith. Thank you. Okay, uh, that. Mr. Lee, Public Safety, what is your commitment regarding the Sheriff's Department funding and staffing levels? Are you aligned with defunding law enforcement or will you work to ensure that Sheriff staffing grows in concert with our population? You're muted. You're muted, uh, Mr. Lee. Got to unmute yourself. There you okay, go. Let's try again. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, I do believe that the uh, Sheriff's Department uh, funding uh, area needs to, we need to look at how we're using our public safety, like I mentioned before. I would rather look at the other issues that's in training or demilitarizing uh, our, our uh, police forces uh, and not really rehiring these police officers that has been fired from other agencies. Those, I think, are things that really needs to be taking place uh, immediately. Um, as far as the population is concerned, if we do have more people uh, as it's growing, uh, I certainly do believe that we cannot stretch our public safety staff thin, number one. Number two is, as I said earlier, the deploying of sheriff's deputy or police officers would deal with homeless issues or mental health issues does not make sense. 
And what we really need to do is allocate more funding to hire psychologists, mental health professionals, and social workers. And I have said this in my platform, in the year 2021, I think we need 21 new psychologists, 21 new social workers, and 21 new uh, mental health specialists. Those are the folks that we really need most to deal with those problems, to basically free up our public safety, to free up our sheriff deputy, to do what they need to do, whether it's about broken windows, whether it's checking and, and, and stealing cars and breaking out windows and stealing the laptops and cars, which has been going completely out of hand. Uh, that we, come out. we also need to be very clear and separate the protesters who are peaceful and rightful under the constitution from the robbers and arsonists. I myself attended the protests in Lopitas and Sunnyvale and the public safety and police officers out there have done a great job in terms of leading the, the, the way to make sure they have a clear passage for protesters to go into, uh, directing traffic to ensure that the protests were peaceful and successful. And they need to have folks out there catching people breaking into the Great Mall, for example. Those are not protesters. Those are robbers. Those are arsonists. Those are guys that just needs to be you know, arrested. So let's get that very clear. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Lee, we're going to move over to uh, <coughs> supervisor role in your campaign. You have one question uh, each for the for you. Uh, briefly tell us what your top three priorities will be if elected to the board. Great. Uh, the number one issue at this point right now, of course, is the COVID-19 preparation. And in this case, really related to emergency preparedness, to making sure that our county hospital is well-funded. Our first uh, responders, shall we say, like our nurses uh, and firefighters, those are the folks who have the proper equipment in order to do their job. Because whether we're talking about wildfire, we're talking about the next pandemic, or just the re, re, reoccurrence that we're all expecting when uh, the fall comes uh, in September, October timeframe, <coughs> we'll these numbers will go back. So we need to make sure that they have the proper equipment to fight these pandemics to keep us safe. And we need to keep them safe so they can do their job. So I think that funding of it is extremely important. And, and corollary to it, of course, is the mental health issues to making sure that those are properly uh, taken care of by the right people and the professionals. Second thing I want to talk about uh, related to, of course, is the homelessness issues. Uh, we really need to get more temporary housing uh, out there. Uh, we really can't let people sleeping on the streets anymore, uh, whether it's underpasses or the creek, this is inhumane. And having temporary housing and, and that is really, really important because we had close to 400 deaths last year in Santa Clara County from those homeless done house. And we really need to keep people off the street to save lives. Uh, and then the third thing I've talked about, of course, is the housing <coughs> issue. We do need to build more housing units. And besides temporary housing, we're talking about a lot of folks who need different type of housing, whether we talk about single family homes, we're talking about apartments, we're talking about condos, we're talking about duplexes, we talk about townhomes. We need to be able to work harder to not have the nimbyism in place and try to get housing where it makes sense, grow them where people have public transportation so that we could actually build quicker uh, to lower the cost of housing. We really just need more housing uh, uh, built in a smart way. Okay, okay thank you. Um, Mr. Chu, uh, what, briefly tell us what your top three priorities would be if elected to the board. Uh, I, I will say mental health first because, you know, I serve on the mental health board. I have a lot of firsthand information, and this is the area that I definitely believe that uh, it's county need to uh, uh, improve on, on their services. And the, uh, the second one, I will say housing slash transportation because I see housing and transportation are kind of the, uh, the two phases of the same problem. You know, uh, I spearheaded the North San Jose Neighborhood Plan uh, with, uh, with the concept of uh, uh, putting the more density, uh, higher density housing in the transit uh, a, a node. And it was a really a, a small growth and I would definitely uh, uh, continue uh, uh, advocate for uh, more of the below market rate housing as, as well as addressing uh, preventing the neighborhood characters as well 
uh, as a, a, pr a, pres a preservation and pre pre prevent uh, pre preventing. Then this a third one I will say public safety. You know, just today I have held uh, two uh, disaster preparedness uh, Zoom meeting, and this is a great opportunity uh, to for me to to advertise. And if you for any reason not being able to, to join us today, please uh, get get onto my assembly website. I have uh, on, uh, one Spanish and and the other one in, uh, in English. I will be doing an, an, a third one tomorrow, two o'clock in, in, in Chinese. So language accessible is also uh, very important in, in, in this area, in this district of Santa Clara County because of its uh, diversity. So when we addressing the, 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 the mental health or the health in general, and when we addressing the, the housing, when we're talking about the public safety, we need to also be mindful of being able to communicate to our constituents in the language they feel most comfortable with. Okay, thank you. Now we only have one question left. One question left, and then we're gonna get, have you each give us a two minute a wrap up uh, for tonight, your, your ending statement here. And the last statement is gonna be dealing with transportation, since it's come up several different ways uh, tonight. Well, Mr. Chu, I'm gonna ask, ask it to you first. BTA's performance metrics are woefully compared to other systems. This has been harshly criticized by the civil grand jury in 08 and again in 2020. Will you seek appointment to the VTA board? And what transportation credentials do you have and what will you do to improve the performance? Well, I, um, what well, that definitely would like to see some changes in the VTA, the, the structure. I have a bill to extend their chairmanship from one year to two years. You know, the problem with the VTA is uh, 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 a lot of uh, uh, board members, you know, the, I, I, I'm, not, I'm saying that from, from the grand jury report, are not really prepared when they go into the meeting. You know, my, my heart goes out for those uh, part-time uh, council members or, or mayors they usually have their day job and 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 then uh, they're also uh, trying their best to manage your city and they and they fight to get onto the vta board and they just spread to still thing and they're not being able to uh, real uh, well vested into this transportation issue and then the, the the structure of the board you got the north county south county and and then you have milpitas so the, 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 there's only one city in, 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 in the east uh, 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 county, uh, east side of the county besides San Jose. So they end up just uh, um, move them uh, to the south county and, and, and have a rotational uh, basis for their representative to, uh, uh, with uh, Morgan Hills and Gilroy. So I think we need to really look at the structure of the VTA and to in terms of transportation, I'm very, very proud to say that I serve on the Assembly Transportation Committee for six years. You know, we have fought for the, 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 the money to electrify the Caltrain and we're even uh, uh, thinking of maybe to extend it all the way to Gilroy. So I do have a lot of uh, uh, um, experience on transportation, not just the rail transportation, the ground transportation, and, 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 uh, and all other type of transportation issues. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Lee, transportation. Once again, VTA's performance metrics are woefully compared to other systems. It has been harshly criticized by the civil grand jury in 2008 and again in 2020. Will you seek appointment to the VTA board? And what transportation credentials do you have? And what will you do to improve the the uh, performance. Yes, I uh, agree completely. Um, and if elected supervisor certainly would uh, seek appointment to the VTA board. Uh, I certainly do believe that we have a failed public transportation system in the Santa Clara County. Uh, in the sense that uh, I, you know, Rod Deardon Sr., who we named the, uh, the station uh, after him, his name, uh, I've actually spoken to Rod, uh, even though he support me, I also criticized him at times and I said, Rod, why don't we build the underground when you first did it? 
because it would have been a lot cheaper to do it at the time. Because what we have seen, if you go to downtown San Jose, for example, they crawl in the downtown. Why do you do so slowly? Because of safety, right? You, you can't really share roads very well. So they go really, really slow. And the time it takes to get from point A to point B, especially through downtown, is absolutely ridiculously long. Number one. Number two is the trip cost of $2.25. These and round trip we have four for five bucks. Okay, a lot of times people get in the car, drive it with gas is actually about the same, if not cheaper. So if it's going to be less costly, why would people take public transportation? So I think it's really important to stay away from this so-called cost recovery model because it's losing money anyways. That model doesn't work. By raising the fare is absolutely the biggest disaster. This is how you kill a public transportation system. If anything, we need to look reverse. There are many cities. Uh, that we've been in, like in Denver, for example, there's a free shuttle right in downtown that people use, they fully use it. Yes, it costs money to run it, but guess what? People use it and there's so much less car in downtown. Uh, how about free transportation for our seniors, for our students? These are the ideas that we really think is long overdue. Our goal needs to be pack up the, the buses or the light rail. When you see buses goes by, especially the, the double uh, buses 22, let's say, how often you see it going by practically with like three people in those buses, it's ridiculous. That's why I think we really need to change the mindset to load it up. I grew up in Hong Kong, we use MTR, the subway, the buses, they are filled up, the cost is much lower, uh, approximately a dollar or so per trip. And I think these are all ways to make people, encourage people to take public transportation. And until we get that under wraps, uh, we, we don't have enough money to build more roads and more lanes. Okay, thank you. Well, gentlemen, first of all. Mr. Hector, yes. can I have, uh, this is Frank. Yes, can sir. you just ask a simple question and just a yes or no answer regarding the split roll, please? And then go to the closing statement. Okay. Can we give it in context here? Sure, uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. I know I saw it somewhere. Okay, uh, what is your position? Um, no, Prop 15 for split road taxation is on the ballot this November. Do you support this proposition, this Proposition 15? This is straight up yes or no. I'll start first of all uh, uh, with Mr. Lee, since you did it uh, with last ago. Prop 15. Yes, it will bring in $250 million per year to Santa Clara County, which we so desperately need. Okay, Mr. Chu, uh, you're muted, you're muted, sir. Canson, you're muted, there you go. Yes, I, uh, yes, I support it. You know, we're talking about a lot of uh, things that we promised to do, but uh, this is one way to ask the large company to step up the play to help with their, their, their employees in their neighborhood. So yes, I will support it. It will help the school as well as the city and maybe be able to uh, uh, divide up some money to do the great separation of our uh, five expressway. Okay, now, uh, first of all, I'm gonna ask each of you to give, give you two minutes to give a summary statement for tonight. I'll give you just a second to pull that together uh, while you're doing that. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the various the Citizens Advisory, Advisory Council for pulling this event together. I think, I think this is great for our community and it's good for all of our constituents. And, and it, various the Citizens Advisory Council also does a great job for our residents here. I'm still a member, even though I don't live in Berryessa. I still try to stay up to do this. That being said, closing statements. I'll start first of all, uh, Mr. Chu. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I that will definitely want to echo my appreciation for the BCAC, the Rona, and uh, all the sponsoring uh, uh, party uh, with the, today's uh, uh, candidate forum. You know, I have requested to uh, to have an opportunity with some of the uh, neighborhood association in in Sunnyvale for many many weeks. They no nobody even responded to me. So I'm really really proud to be a member of this uh, BCAC for the 20 years. And I'm very, very honored to receive the Citizen of the Years about seven some years ago. And most importantly, I want to thank you for investing in me uh, in, in for, for the last 20 years, you know, being a public uh, a servant, uh, an elected official. I know I have probably cast more than 10,000 votes 
on various uh, bills. I know nobody, including uh, my wife, will agree with me on every vote that I have uh, taken. But I can assure you that I always have the best interests of the future of our state, of our county, our city, and our school in mind when I cast my vote. You know, I was very honored to receive uh, the uh, um, endorsement from Congressman Ro Khanna, as well as uh, um, Council Member uh, Arenas, that represent the Evergreen District, uh, Perales, and uh, Esparza. But I'm so proud to <laughs> receive the endorsement of the two candidates in the primary election who are as committed to Santa Clara County District 3, three especially on the east side, as I do. And they are the Honorable <clears throat> Council Member Magdalena Carrasco and the community activist, John Leva. Uh, I'm not looking for an elected position as the stepping stone for a, a, any higher position. I'm a willing, ready, and able supervisor that can hit the road and run it. You know, during this uh, very challenging time in the county, I respectfully ask for your support. And please connect me uh, on Facebook or, or, uh, or my, my website. Thank you very much. Well, you did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chu. Uh, Mr. Lee, your, uh, your closing statements, please. You're muted. You're muted right now as well. All right, I'll try again. Thank you, Will. Uh, thank you for your great job and uh, the members of BCC and all your supporting organizations to uh, taking time to speak with us this evening. Uh, with five members on the board, you need three votes. Uh, I'm very honored to say that I've been endorsed by both current supervisors, Susan Ellenberg and Joseph Midian. And those are the partners I will look forward to work with to make Santa Clara County a better place for everyone. And I will work with everybody who is on the board, obviously. I have dedicated my life to serve the public, to improve our community. And this is why I'm now running for supervisor to help solve problems, our homelessness issues, the housing costs, as I mentioned earlier, our neighborhoods, and honestly, the reopening of the economy and this budget deficit is gonna be a real nightmare that we have to all work together. It's gonna to take some very difficult decisions. We have many students and teachers that needs housing. Uh, we have so many at risk families and veterans. And that's the reason why I believe a unity candidate like myself is one that we really need to be able to work both sides between the chamber and labor. Uh, for example, San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo, along with two other San Jose, uh, Pam, Pam Foley and uh, uh, Council Member uh, Jimenez uh, are all supporting my campaign. We recently got endorsed also by Senator Wykowski, uh, and I'm very honored to also say that uh, Basically, every county supervisor, former county supervisor that's represented this district from Pete Mayu, Ron Gonzalez, Dan Corkadel, if you remember that far back, uh, have also uh, endorsed our campaign along with Don Calvarado, uh, including our next uh, assemblyman uh, candidate, uh, Alex Lee. Uh, these are all supporters. And by the way, Alex Lee is not related to me. Some people ask if that was my son, but I didn't. <laughs> We is a good friend, I'm honored to get support, but no, we are not actually related, but we do certainly share many of the issues and values. And you can see from Sam Lee Carl, they actually with people from the left and from the right uh, that's coming to our campaign because we really need to have everybody on board to solve this problem together. And again, I'm truly honored to be uh, speaking with you this evening and look forward to serving as your county supervisor for District 3 for many years to come. Thank you very, very much for your time tonight. Well, thank you both gentlemen. We appreciate you giving up the time and spending some time sharing your uh, uh, inner uh, thoughts with us as we move forward toward the November 3rd election. Uh, once again, um, it's been my honor to, to be able to have the opportunity to moderate this discussion. And that being said, I'm gonna turn it back over to our president, Ms. Linda Locke. Thanks, Will. I, I'm very impressed with both candidates. They're very knowledgeable and it's wonderful <laughs> See how both of you really care deeply for our county, and it's, it'll be really refreshing to be able to work with either one of you. We respect you. We thank you for your time. We didn't realize it would go over quite this late, but it's well worth hearing what everybody had to say, what both of you had to say. Will, you did a really nice job. I certainly appreciate your coming back and, and helping us out. So, I appreciate the call. Thank you.
Okay, so uh, our next general membership meeting is supposed to be October 12th. Um, and we probably will end up doing a Zoom meeting like we're doing now, since we probably won't be able to get together. Community Center usually isn't open. It hasn't been open for a while. So anyway, I say good night to you all. Thanks for, Ty did a ton of work getting this all organized and making sure everybody got notified. Uh, yes. Got rules and regulations out. So uh, Ty did a great job. Susan really helped collect all of the questions from all of the people that came in. So thank all of you very, very much. Thank, thank you, Linda. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you, thank Ty. You. Have a good evening, Have a great everybody. evening. The rest all of right. the evening. Thanks, Eric, for, thank thank Eric for all you did. All <laughs> keeping right. us moving. Yeah, Eric, bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. technical person. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Will. Good night.